Well, good evening, Torrance First Baptist. It's a pleasure to be with you again on this fourth installment. You have an opportunity to get to know me and my heart a little bit tonight. I hope you can recognize that we're sitting in the nursery at Torrance First Baptist. And as I'm looking on the wall, it has a passage from Luke 18, 16 through 17. It says, Then Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like children. I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that fact, that uh, we need to come to him humbly and just seeking his, his will for our lives and his face and understanding that you know, that's what he desires from us, to just come to him with open arms. I love, you know, I have children myself and I love when they were little and they would just reach their arms out, and, daddy, and uh, just, just such a, a blessing to just be able to pick them up and, and love them and to see the, the, their faces just light up <clears throat> when I would come home from work. Um, and so one of the things that I loved as well when I was a child was, was story time. I, I love stories. Um, I, I used to love listening to my dad. He would read us uh, from the Chronicles of Narnia and he would read from The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and one of the things that, that I've enjoyed even over this, this time of having to stay at home is listening to, to audible books. I actually just got finished listening to the Chronicles of Narnia and I listened to A Brave New World, which I hadn't heard before. And, um, and right now I'm in the middle of Jane Eyre, uh, of all things. Um, so I, I just, I love stories. I, I love literature. When I was a teacher, I used to read to the students every day. I would um, open up, you know, I worked at a Christian school, so again, I would read Chronicles of Narnia or other things to them and, and uh, every day after lunch. Um, and they would really enjoy that time. And when my kids were younger, of course, I had continued the tradition of my dad and I would just read stories to them and, and try, to, try to make it as alive as possible, try to do different voices for the different characters. And, and they always enjoyed that. <clears throat> And even as serving as a children's pastor for the last few years, the kids on Wednesday night would love when I would just kind of sit down in a chair, just like this one, like a rocking chair, and open a book and just read them a story. There's something about stories that, that draw us into, um, into, the, into the truth. And, and you know, Christ is that way too. He draws us into himself because he, he invites us into his story to be a part of it. And so that's what we're going to do right now. Story time with Pastor Jared. And the story I want to share with you tonight, however, it's not fantasy. It's not fiction. Um, it's very real. Uh, it's a story that took place right after the resurrection of Christ. And you can find it in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 35. But what I want to do right now is I want us to enter this, this scene together. Imagine you have been following this itinerant preacher. You've listened to and, and been enthralled by his teaching. You've enjoyed seeing the scripture come to life as he pointed to the coming of, of the kingdom of God as he revealed himself through it. You, you've witnessed him do the miraculous, turning water into wine, multiplying a few loaves and, and fish to feed thousands, casting out demons, calming the storm, walking on water. You've watched as he was showered with praise as he entered into the city of Jerusalem and how he dealt with the Pharisees, putting them in their place time and time again. But you were also there as he was betrayed by one of his own, unjustly accused and tried and finally crucified. How could it have come to that? He was supposed to be the Messiah, the one to defeat Rome and redeem the people of Israel. He was supposed to usher in the kingdom of God, enacting justice and reigning in peace. He was supposed to conquer, not be conquered, not be killed like a criminal. Confusion, uncertainty, an unsettled spirit is upon you and all of his disciples. Yet, some of the women have, have told you that something that seems utterly impossible 
they went to the tomb to prepare his body, only to find that the stone had been rolled away. No, no body. And, and they're, they're telling this fantastic tale of angels appearing and declaring that Jesus had risen from the dead. It's too crazy to believe. It defies the laws of nature and of, of logic, of, of reason. So Peter and some of the other disciples run off to see for themselves, but they get there and the tomb was empty. They didn't see him. So what do you do? You, know, you, you, you take a walk to clear your head, get some perspective, maybe just to be in the fresh air. You and another disciple are, are walking to a village called Emmaus. Okay, it's more than just a little stroll. It's a seven-mile journey. But there's a lot to think about. You have all of these events swirling in your head. The, the conversation even gets a bit heated as you're just struggling to put words to it, to make sense of it all. And then out of nowhere, another traveler joins you on the road. Not unusual as people were coming and going. Passover week had just concluded. You don't recognize him though, or, or at least something is keeping you from recognizing him. You must have looked like quite the sight. A picture of, of glue. For immediately he asks what you've been discussing. You do double take. It seems Pretty obvious to you that he should know what you've been talking about. Haven't you heard the news? Have you been living in a cave under a rock somewhere? You're literally the only one around here who doesn't know what's been going on. Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet who acted and spoke with such great power, was unceremoniously handed over to Rome by our own chief priests and other leaders to be condemned to death. Surely, you must have heard about him. Three days ago, they, they crucified him. You say it through a lump in your throat. And he was supposed to redeem Israel. He was supposed to be our hope. And now, He's, he's dead. And even worse, the, the body's gone. You relate to him what the women and the other disciples have told you. You risk telling him the truth about your connection even to his group of followers. You know, maybe there's something in him. Or maybe because at this point you just don't care. But before you can get any further, this man, this stranger, he calls you out. You are so senseless, he says. Don't you see? This is what had to happen. You're such typical Jews, so slow to believe, to see the truth, even when it's staring you in the face. The prophets have been trying to get your attention for centuries. They've been telling you that God was going to act, that he was going to send his anointed one, the Messiah, who was coming not to conquer Rome, but to do something even greater. But it had to be done through suffering. Then, and only then would he come into his glory and you would come with him. And then this guy, he, he proceeds to open up the scriptures and he explains how all of it, the whole story from Moses and the law to the prophets, all of it was pointing to this person, the Messiah. You have been reading it through the wrong end of the telescope. You've seen it as the story of how God would redeem Israel from suffering. When instead, you should have seen it as the story of how God would redeem Israel through suffering. This is what had to happen. 
obviously, this telling had taken some time, as you begin to draw near to your destination, you're pretty tired, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually spent. Yet it seems like he's getting a second wind and he's just going to keep on traveling down that road. Wait, wait, wait. We need to hear more, you say. You must be tired. Come join us for dinner and rest before you continue on your journey. We insist. And what do you know? He obliges. As if telling you all the things he did on the road weren't enough, he does something now which blows your mind. You are supposed to be the host. He's your guest, and you're supposed to serve him. But instead, he serves you. He takes bread, gives thanks, breaks the bread, and then gives it to you. And bam! Eyes open, mind open, heart open, hands open. You realize this stranger, dusty from the road, you don't even know. Now you realize it's him. It's Jesus. But before you have the chance to scream or cry or shout or hug him or fall to your knees in worship, he disappears. Go on. You turn to each other and you say, duh, weren't our hearts burning within our chests as he spoke on the road, as he opened up God's holy scriptures? It took this breaking of the bread to open your eyes. The story has come full circle. Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree in the garden, and their eyes were opened to their nakedness, their shame, their guilt, and their sin. You have dined with the bread of life himself, and your eyes have been opened to the reality of redemption, to forgiveness, to life everlasting, abundant, and free. This news, oh man, this is so, so exciting. In fact, too exciting to keep. So despite the fact that you are exhausted and it's really late, you get up right then and there and you run, you run back to Jerusalem. You just have to find your friends, the other followers of Jesus, to tell them the good news. You get back. You find them all already gathered, saying that Jesus is risen and that he appeared to Simon. You tell them your story and how he was revealed to you in the breaking of the bread, the word and the sacrament hand in hand, hearing his voice cry out from scripture, knowing his presence in communion. This is the way. He is the way, the truth and the life. You know that this is just the beginning of the story. And you can't wait to see what happens next. The end. Or should we say, the beginning. If I may offer a couple of closing thoughts on this story. And how it might apply to you and I today. First. We see Jesus revealed through his word. We need to learn how to read the scriptures in light of that, with him as our teacher. When we study the Bible individually, in small groups, even as a congregation, we need to pray for his presence and his guidance through his Holy Spirit. And we need to prepare ourselves for teaching, for rebuke, even correction, for training in righteousness. We need to read the whole story. Do our hearts, does my heart burn within me when we read the word? I have to confess that as I'm reading through numbers in my daily devotions, that mine often doesn't. Um, 
there's a lot of numbers in numbers, <laughs> a lot of details. And it's, and it's easy to do it by rote, isn't it? To take the stories, which, which well, we've heard from childhood, many of us, for granted. As we carefully study together, though, our understanding hopefully will deepen and real lasting application will take place. Let's you and I come to the word afresh. With him at our side, our hearts will burn. And secondly, not only do we see Jesus revealed through his word, but we see Jesus revealed through the breaking of bread. It's no accident that the author of the Gospel of Luke, Luke himself, records so many different instances of Jesus gathering around tables, eating with people, breaking bread together. So scripture and, and, and the ordinance of communion are, are so joined together. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. He's the bread of life. Every time we share a meal together, we ought to be reminded of this. Every time we gather together for communion, we're told to do this in remembrance of Jesus. On Sunday, we will celebrate both the preaching of the word and the breaking of the bread and drinking of the cup. I want to encourage you, prepare your hearts for both of those between now and then. I'll be sharing from a passage that is near and dear to my heart, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, in which we are encouraged to run the race of life by fixing our eyes on Jesus. We will also have a time of communion where we will remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross. I hope that you will be able to join us online as we gather together to fix our eyes on Jesus. God bless you. Thank you.